Hi, everybody. Hello. I'll give you a minute to connect to sound. Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 1016th New Social Environment. I'm Chloe Stagaman, Director of Programs here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and extreme privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Emily Chang, Mel Chin, Charles Yuan, Jennifer Samet, and Eugenie Sai. And now I'll introduce today's guests and host. Emily Chang is a painter born in New York City where she works and lives. Her large scale symmetrical abstractions draw on reference imagery from throughout history, such as 15th century European ornament, Chinese landscapes, or Zhu dynasty goddesses, and are imbued with an overwhelming hypnotic quality. She has had six solo shows in Asia and is currently in the Shanghai Biennial. Mel Chin is an artist known for the broad range of approaches in his art, including works that require multidisciplinary collaborative teamwork and works that enlist science as an aesthetic component to developing complex ideas. His practice calls attention to complex social and environmental issues through an expansive body of work ranging from collages, sculptural objects, animated films, video games, to large-scale collaboratively produced public installations. Charles Yuan is a painter who lives and works in Brooklyn. An early member of Godzilla Asian American Arts Network, he sees art as connected to a social and civic vision, and he considers his work to be part catharsis, part poetics, inherently iconoclastic. Yuan's paintings have simultaneous literal and symbolic meanings. His father was a scientist, and he incorporates molecular structures and gravitational waveforms into his compositions while simultaneously flattening their perspective. Jennifer Samet is a director of Eric Firestone Gallery and an art historian and curator who specializes in contemporary and post-war painting. She's a member of the faculty at the New York Studio School and author of the column Beer with a Painter and Hyperallergic. And our host today, Eugenie Tsai, is a curator and writer based in New York. After 16 years, she recently stepped down from her position as the John and Barbara Bogelstein Senior Curator Contemporary Art at the Brooklyn Museum. During those years, she shaped the contemporary collection and organized around 40 loan and collection exhibitions, among them Oscar Yeho, East of Sun, West of Moon, and Kehinde Wiley, A New Republic. And with that, I am going to pass it over to Eugenie to get us started. Thank you, Chloe. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity to talk a little bit about Godzilla, Asian American Art Network, in conjunction with an exhibition that opened, I think, last month at Eric Firestone Gallery, organized by Jennifer Samet, called um, Godzilla, Echoes of the 90s Asian American Art Networks. So today we'll talk a bit about uh, Godzilla itself and we'll have an opportunity to walk through the exhibition with Jennifer and the artists, um, Mel Chin, Emily Chang and Charles Yuan who are all in the exhibition. So I'd like to start by giving you a very brief summary of Godzilla and how and when it started. I am taking my information. I was an early member of Godzilla. I think I joined in early, around late 1990, um, perhaps early 1991. But I am taking my summary from um, an, es uh, an essay called Origin Myths, A Short and Incomplete History of Godzilla, written by the art historian and scholar and Godzilla member, Karen Higa. It appears in her book, Hidden in Plain Sight, um, who left this world prematurely. So I'm just going to, for those of you who want to read the essay, it can be found in this book, which I know uh, will be put in the chat. Um, and so um, there are three artists who started Godzilla, Margot Machida, Bing Li, and Ken Chu. Um, they met in July of 1990 in Margot's loft uh, to discuss ideas for forming an Asian American arts institution that would begin to address the emerging needs of contemporary Asian American visual artists. 
Some of the things they discussed were a publication or newsletter, the creation of an Asian American museum, as well as a library. And there was some discussion about presenting a historical show documenting Asian American community arts movements of the 60s and 70s, which um, uh, Arlen Huang, another soon to be member um, was talking about. So um, if you, um, so this, this is just kind of the, the bare bones of, of how the organization that came to be Godzilla came into being. It is, um, we're gonna talk about the name Godzilla, but so from their discussions emerged an organization, a collective, I'm gonna call it a collective that came to be called Godzilla that was active from about 1990 to 2001. It was dedicated, it was an advocacy group. It was dedicated to raising the profile of Asian American artists and art professionals in the art world. I'm sure many of you are familiar with a recently, another recently published book uh, called Godzilla Asian American Arts Network, this tome edited by Howie Chen, published by Primary Documents, which is a compilation of many, um, exactly, you know, many uh, documents from Godzilla, um, minutes from meetings, uh, newsletters, uh, just really pieces of ephemera from which you can reconstruct the history of Godzilla from throughout the decade. So that is, that's a really important source uh, for um, anything Godzilla related. If you're curious, take a look at it. So um, I know Bing was going to be with us and he was going to talk, I was going to ask him to talk a little bit about the formation of Godzilla, but, but he did send, um, he was unable to join us, but he did send a statement, which Mel Chin is going to read. And it talks a bit about uh, the title Godzilla itself. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to Mel. Yes, thank you, Eugenie, and thank you all for being here. Um, seems like old times. Um, yeah. Bing and I uh, were part of an exhibition uh, called Public Art in Chinatown, if you remember, back in the 80s. And I, we, we associated and became friends at that time. We went wilding in the streets of Chinatown trying to find the perfect feng shui or wind water master to assist in the production of a park I was planning for the homeless in Chinatown. And so uh, we met a lot of charlatans and we met a lot of businessmen and we finally came upon uh, uh, Mr. Tran who was uh, feared by the Tongs, uh, a member of the Black Hat School of Taoism, and uh, would go and would set no money and go into trances in order to create what they would call a fu, which is a talisman, as well as his knowledge of Taoism and his, me his methodologies were fundamental in thinking about the garden where the wild grass obscures the true pearl, the piece that finally came out of that. Anyway, this is a fu uh, created by Bing, my dear comrade and friend from that day, th those times on. Uh, I don't think if, if Bing asked me to do anything and uh, likewise, we feel we've been traveling together in China, we've done things and uh, I consider him a true brother. And I'm sorry, he's not here today, but he did prepare a statement about those that maybe kung fu's or, or about fu's, and uh, this is a statement rel relative to Godzilla and the food talisman. So, in Taoism practice, fu talisman is a communication tool to summon spirits to fight against demons. It works when the message sends through a media, which is the chanting in most cases. Talisman with chanting did not create the spirits, but merely awaken them. Godzilla, the Japanese movie character, was not born to fight against other monsters. It existed like the spirits in Taoism practice. It came out of the nuclear ashes to roar 
roaring out loud and fighting with power to bring back the world in peace and order, then went back to the ocean. But Godzilla still exists, waiting to come out again and again whenever needed. Godzilla Asian and American Art Network has this Japanese movie character serving well as the mascot. When they, whenever Asian American art professional fight for their rights, they have the voice to say it loud and clear. Like that was in practice, Godzilla needs media to send the message and the media is art. Let's roar and roar. Thank you, Mel. So people always ask about the, the name Godzilla. And I'm, I'm wondering um, if we can just devote a few minutes to discussing that. Bing is talking about what it means to him and, and, um, and, and Emily and Mel and Charles, do you have any recollections of the title and how it came into being? As I recall, um, the first meeting I went to, uh, one of our homework assignments was to think about a name. And then, so the next meeting, <laughs> um, I was a huge fan of the movies at the time. And I think, as I recall, I was on the subway thinking, oh, we should call it Godzilla. <laughs> And, uh, and so, you know, went to the meeting and, and it seems to me that a lot of uh, these groups, their names were very descriptive of what their mission was and what they were doing. And so predictably, you know, names are tossed out like, oh, the Asian American Art Network and things like that. And I thought, well, that's descriptive, but it's, it's kind of boring. Boring. Uh, I remember yeah. that. <laughs> and 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 I'm looking around. It's all these young, dynamic people, and so I propose Godzilla. And uh, yeah, yeah. And and interestingly, I as I recall, by the end of the meeting, we had decided on a name, which is a pretty quick. Yeah, given. absolutely. And I remember people thought, "Oh, we're saying is it too Japanese?" Or yeah. Anything? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um. Because Which I always thought was a valid criticism, but yeah, um, the Pan Asian group, um, yeah. and also I think there was some feeling that there was this sense of violence or aggression um, that Bing mentions this dynamism that was was intended to counter this uh, kind of stereotype of stereotypical views yes. of activity and you know of Asian Americans. So I people just went with it, um, and I see that we have. Um, our slideshow running. So maybe um, I was going to ask, let's start first with Jennifer and talk a bit about the show itself and how it came into being at Eric Firestone Galleries, fill in both of its spaces, um, uh, and which gives it a real prominence, I think, in, in, on, um, in Lower Manhattan. So Jennifer, can you tell us a little about how the show came in, in you know, how you came upon Godzilla, but, you know, if you'd been aware of the group and, and what you were thinking about in terms of um, presenting this exhibition at the gallery. And I know you worked on it with your team, so you and your team. Jen <clears throat> Sorry. Um, hi. I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for being here too. And thank you, Eugenie, for hosting. Such an honor. So um, yes, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, there's a few different, I think there's a few different reasons the show came about. Um, one of them is that in our gallery, we definitely are committed to historical re-examination um, and really interrogating the canon of post-war American and particularly New York art. Um, so I think that um, looking at an Asian American art collective really fall into line with our mission as a gallery and looking at, you know, when you really interrogate the canon, I always say that um, you come up with a lot of women and a lot of artists of color because they have been um, marginalized and left out 
um, of institutional, you know, histories, et cetera. Um, so I think that that's one of the main reasons that, you know, it came about. I know that, um, you know, we were looking at, and a former colleague of mine was really um, spearheading this research, looking at um, other identity-based um, art collectives. And that sort of came about because we represent the estate of Joe Overstreet, um, who was one of the founders of King Kelleba House, which um, still exists. It was founded in 1974 um, and still on East 2nd Street. And, um, and in fact, Ken Kelleba House um, collaborated with the Asian American Art Center and there was an exhibition that they hosted that was called um, Hong Kong, Tokyo, New York, where um, it basically sort of paired um, African-American artists and Asian-American artists. And um, so through that research, we were actually looking more at uh, 70s and 80s identity-based collectives. And then, um, and, and through that, research and looking at Asian American Art Center and Basement Workshop, I became more drawn or intrigued by um, Godzilla. And um, and there's also, I think, a bit more of um, research that's already been done about Godzilla. So I really was definitely not, you know, starting from scratch. Um, the Howie Chen um, anthology that you mentioned, Eugenie, um, and then uh, Herb Tam, uh, who's the curator at the Museum of Chinese in America, had done a significant amount of research on Godzilla as well. Um, and archives are there and at NYU. Um, so, and, you know, writings, as you mentioned, by Karen Higa and Alexander Chang, et cetera, sort of allowed me um, to do this research with my team, as you said. Um, and so we worked together going, basically going through um, you know, Howie Chen's book and um, sort of creating a spreadsheet of artists and to look at. And uh, I would say that um, also another factor, which I don't think I, you know how you realize things about yourself, like after you do them, like that there's a connection to all of the art historical work or creative work that you've done in your career. But I, I started thinking about the fact that I've always been interested in, um, artist-run projects and artist-run spaces. I just think that that's, you know, like the coolest, most amazing thing when artists, um, you know, take it upon themselves with their own initiative and their own energy um, and their own um, creative powers and really start something themselves. And I think that that was probably one of the reasons I was especially um, drawn to Godzilla. And so, and then the other thing is that you know, when we when we were starting the research and looking at, at the artists and I started to do studio visits, I can't say that I already knew that we were going to do an exhibition. It was really inspired by all of you. And I know that there's a lot of um, Godzilla members. I saw some names come up in the in the waiting room. And um, I know that a number of you are here. And really, I have to say that just by looking at the work and getting to know all of you and um, there's a good percentage of artists um, in the exhibition who were new to me. And, um, you know, it was it was really inspired by, by the work that I was seeing and how um, powerful I thought it was, um, meaningful, um, you know, visually compelling and inspiring and as well as all of the stories that I was learning in the process of putting this together. And I think we all really were at the gallery. Thanks. Do you want to give us a little walkthrough and can we find the works by, by Emily and Mel and Charles to, um, to just talk about since they're here and yeah. All right. Oh, did you make a gallery? Uh, did you make a studio visit with Mel in person or a virtual visit or? Um, we did not um, because uh, Mel is in uh, North Carolina, right, Mel? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so I didn't. I didn't visit him in um, in person. We just uh, spoke 
you know, over the phone um, and, you know, started to talk and um, talk about work. Um, and, and Mel suggested this um, work on paper that a study for an installation piece called Cabinet of Bing. Um, it's, I mean, it's a really beautiful, incredible piece um, that I hadn't really anticipated until I saw it in person, just like how painterly and, you know, gorgeous it is. Um, but I, I did think um, that this was an interesting um, piece that I'm glad that, uh, that we had the opportunity to um, read Bing's statement and how he talked about Godzilla and um you know the power of Godzilla and the um and you know making noise and I thought that the piece by Mel actually spoke to that a little bit um just you know this creature who is not silent yeah and, and first I have to thank Jen uh, first Bing again Bing called me said hey Jen over at Firestone's doing this show please call her and so again, when Brother Bing calls, we we laugh and we talk. And, and then I have to call this gallery in New York. And then I speak to Jen. And, I, and Jen, I apologize. I was always very resistant. And uh, <laughs> at anyone. And I'm in my wannabe witness protection program thinking about what could happen. And so this piece, I'm glad to submit this piece, which is a commentary on the silence my family had about uh, my grandfather's addiction to opium that caused his death and poverty and, and that we were not allowed to speak of it. So this piece was very much in line with what you're describing and what Bing was describing, the voice you need to confront and, and speak of. Uh, so again, patience, uh, a great virtue that you exercise as I, first I sent the drawing, then I had to make the frame, <laughs> which is based on an opium pipe, um, strange uh, piece, but, uh, and putting it in for me. So I appreciate the gallery and, and Bing and you, Jen, for not dressing me down for trying to make it to a show in time, you know? Oh, so, well, we appreciate sorry. you. Uh, well, thank you. I'm glad to send the exhibition. Now, let's see. Uh, that is mislabeled. That's not my piece. I was yeah. going to say. <laughs> <laughs> it is mislabeled. It was um, um, Charles's name was at the top, but then the correct name was right oh, underneath, okay. which is um, <laughs> which is Kim Ano. But and, you know, it's really interesting to uh, to hear Mel's story about the Chinatown trip with Bing uh, and looking for. Um, a, a Taoist uh, master to talk to because I thought to myself, how did they know uh, who was authentic and who wasn't? And then I remembered that Bing and I had a long conversation that he had a grandfather who uh, has an enormous library on Taoism. The interesting thing oh. about uh, about when Godzilla was formed was that... Um, at that time in the 90s, I wasn't really, Taoism wasn't on my mental map. And it has become probably the most dominant, one of the most dominant things on my mental map as of the last decade. Uh, so I, I thought to myself, you know, it's kind of a, a, a sort of a circle how um, it it impacts different countries at different times and it impacts different individuals at different times. But what is an interesting to me is that uh, something that was uh, kind of um, formed an awareness in the, the Warring States period in China, which is uh, I think fourth century BC, is so important to contemporary life the way we think about connectivity and the way we think about the entire universe. So um, this painting is a little bit about the, the, the vision that we can have going into uh, what we see as the connective tissue between 
our life on earth and something beyond. So we have the, you know, the red uh, circle at the bottom, which kind of corresponds to the lower chakra. And then we move up in a vertical uh, ascension with not in a straight line, but kind of meandering until we get to the top. And the two um, the two spirals coming out of the sides of the eye shape is uh, is is housed inside a stupa on on the right and the left, and the points point into the center. So that is a little bit about the uh, the the vision that we might have. Um, in through the questions of uh, what religion has uh, sort of made us aware of. But, you know, I just, I do want to say that, you know, it's, it's been, um, it's been wonderful to be with this, be in this show and to be, to think about the nineties, think about what, uh, what we were very much concerned about at that time. And also what we, uh, how we are thinking about these things and how they permutated into the world we are we're living in today, which is quite Thank different. Thank you. So Emily, can you just comment a little bit about what was important in the 90s? Um, I was very interested, and I think I spoke about this at the gallery in the panel discussion. Uh, I was very interested in, in uh, visual languages. So I was very interested in how the Western um, drapery was very three-dimensionally oriented and tactically oriented and really materialistically oriented. And that the Eastern was very much about line and the line was uh, about the spirit, about how spirit moves. Uh, so I felt a very pull between the two because I'd grown up in America, had, um, you know, my, my parents were both Chinese, but Western educated. So um, I didn't, I was, I kind of felt uh, a pull between the two uh, sort of philosophical bases. And I thought it would, it created a, a tension in me that was like a binary opposition. Today, I don't see it as a binary opposition. I see it as uh, a whole. And that, that, that's thank, uh, thanks to my uh, maturity. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, one of the things this um, well, uh, reminds me um, a bit of is is Karen Higa's observation, um, um, Jennifer, the way you put the show together um, and looking at the work of of Mel and um, Emily and and soon Charles. But um, Karen mentions that the, one of the things she admired about the early incarnation of Godzilla is what she says: its lack of structure its openness to diverse formal and conceptual artistic practices and non-judgmental stance to varying approaches to Asian American identity. And I think that really, um, to me, sums up the show. There, there is just this openness to um, different, widely, wildly different visions, mm -hmm. um, which I think we appreciate. I mean, I certainly do. Um, um, so Charles, yeah, this looks more like the work I'm, <laughs> I was for a moment there, I was like, wait a minute. Um, yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah, how did you, and you know, tell us a little bit about your discussions with Jennifer or your decision to show this work. Um, uh, well, it was actually Jennifer's decision to show the work. <laughs> okay. um, and, you know, this, the inventory of 90s paintings, not huge in my, <laughs> Uh, storage space, but um, well, on this painting, I'd like to pick up on something that uh, Emily mentioned was that linearity um, and its association with uh, Asian art. And I had uh, sort of arrived at a very similar, at about the same time, um, some similar conclusions uh, about art and, and linearity. I was, um, <clears throat> Well, basically, I was I was reading things like Orientalism and so on, and looking at um, uh, kind of stereotypes of Asianness and how it uh, in in Europe it seemed to express itself with this linearity, uh, sort of you know morphing into Art Deco and these sorts of things. And uh, I 
began to be very interested in uh, what I considered very sinuous linear qualities. Um, and that this is along the journey. Uh, this painting is, you know, in the mid nineties. So, um, yeah. Uh, and so my journey in a sense, very, very generalized, um, was I'm from Hawaii originally, and I got to uh, New York uh, basically in 1980. And the uh, the stereotypes and notions uh, surrounding Asian people are, are very different in Hawaii. So I was confronted with uh, kind of a really a culture shock uh, when arriving here. I mean, I, I mean, I was kind of familiar just through reading newspapers and things, uh, but because of that, it sort of caused me to uh, look at identity and um, as one component of my art. It's a, yeah. And uh, so in the beginning, I was um, really doing paintings about Asian stereotypes and so on. And this is a little bit further in my journey of uh, identity and art making um, where I was transitioning from say representing Asianness and looking at Asianness mm -hmm. to embodying it more, and uh, I had at about this time uh, had a real epiphany involving Persian miniatures, and it struck me that their formal their formal language uh, was they were able to I mean that was a non Western modality, uh, and so I was very attracted to it, and so it's. Um, incorporating a lot of elements that I learned from um, Persian miniatures. For instance, just the notion of being involved in the space rather than looking at the space, uh, these sorts of mm. things. And um, and in this, this group of paintings, I was looking at um, what I called in my mind, a picture within a picture. So having various narratives going on in a work and I wanted it. Um, well, actually, I thought, you know, my biggest competitor is TV. <laughs> and TV is <laughs> awesome. It moves. It makes noise, all this stuff. Uh, so but with this, I thought, you know, I'll do pictures, these different narratives. And then depending, it can be dynamic because depending on the viewers, whatever their emotional state at the time, however they come to it, uh, you know, it could inscribe different stories and different narratives. So. I felt like I could try to get, I was trying to approach some sort of dynamic narrative space also. That also comes from Persian miniatures where you have the same character popping up all over the place in different scenarios. Uh, Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so I mean, everyone seems to be talking about hybridity and, and incorporating mm -hmm. different artistic traditions, except mm -hmm. maybe Mel, perhaps you, well, Yours is the most related to traditional Chinese brush painting, I think, of, of all of these. <laughs> <laughs> I did it on purpose because I don't. You, know, you were looking back yeah. at your grandfather. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. I just I just said, look, um, OK, I'm going to spring one on you. <laughs> <laughs> I do all these things on the side. So, no, it had to be shown. So I'm glad it had opportunity. I, I'm, I'm glad you fingered me right there. Yeah. Kind of an Asian thing. <laughs> so Jennifer, do you want to uh, maybe we could look at Bing's mural and uh, I, I'm and or if are there should we do another? Yeah, just sure. finish walking through the space a bit and yeah, I'm happy to. Yes. So um, yes, I appreciate what you said, Eugene, a few moments ago about um the uh, diversity in the exhibition and um the openness, I definitely was very, and I tried to actually follow the lead of um, Godzilla, you know, um, it was always a network without a clear um, membership per se. Uh, there were no membership dues. Um, what I'm told is people could be as involved or um, just a bit involved as they liked. Um, and at a certain point in working on the exhibition and thinking about it, I basically realized, you know, this is a show about individual artists and their work and their individual voices. And 
that was really once I once I sort of realized or determined that everything felt I don't know everything kind of fell into place for me um that you know I definitely wasn't going to try to locate like one um theme that bridges all of the work uh you know or try to link all of the artists in some way um and rather acknowledge the heterogeneity of the group and um the diverse I mean there's a huge diversity in terms of um cultural national heritage that's represented in the exhibition and um and I feel like you know that that's just really exciting it's visually exciting um so this is yes I'm glad we're showing um the mural that being did for the exhibition um when I was looking into his work and we were looking at the picto diaries that are um, the small works you know and across the middle um I started to realize that he's done this done a lot of murals a lot of wall painting and that sometimes he's installed the picto diaries on top of the wall painting and I definitely wanted to represent that um this is actually at the very entryway of the gallery and it also seems fitting to have since Bing is the only one of the three co-founders that's represented in the exhibition it, it definitely seemed fitting to sort of open with his work yeah absolutely and it does show his love of scale the extremes of the mural and then his very small intimate pictographs pictograms mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. beautifully uh, it's also in very close proximity to his subway stop at Canal Street, which yes. is a grid of the um, of the pictograms. Mm -hmm. so, and there's um, many I, artists in the exhibition who are represented in the MTA, which I kind of I actually thought about and found interesting. There's something about um, I think the MTA that it it's a bit more I don't know democratic or like community um focus that it was just interesting to see um that a, you know a lot of the artists who maybe aren't represented like in museum collections etc are actually represented in the mta um absolutely so, yeah no so, I, there's there are a few artists who in the show who were not part of godzilla and i'm just curious about your decision to to do that to include them so, it's still um, very much in the yeah, in the spirit of, but I'm, I'm, I was just, yeah, wondering. So, uh, because um, Godzilla was an open structure network, I was also struggling in the beginning of, well, who's, who's represented in the show? How do I determine who's, you know, a very involved member or an early member or an original member or this and that and um how to sort of set the curatorial parameters for the exhibition but um at some point and actually I'm trying to remember it I wonder if Bing had this idea or um because I know we talked about it a little bit but um you know one of the things that was really inspiring to me were the exhibitions that Godzilla organized so members of Godzilla, um, you know, took it upon themselves to organize exhibitions at art in general or artist space. And I was really inspired by those shows, especially a couple of them. Um, one of them being uh, the D Dismantling Invisibility exhibition that was about AIDS and visibility in the Asian um, community. And another exhibition that was called the Cheerio Shop Show, which mm -hmm. appropriated the idea of the Chinatown Cheerio Shop. Um, and so I believe that everyone in the exhibition, so my parameters were, um, artists who, uh, exhibited in one of the Godzilla organized exhibitions. Um, and that was really, th those were the parameters that I used. Um, mm -hmm. and that made everything a lot more, you know, straightforward. Yeah. <laughs> yes, um, I can imagine. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. and very much. In keeping with the spirit of Godzilla, it was mm -hmm. definitely a horizontal structure. I think Ken Chu was probably the driving force for many years. Would you agree, uh, Godzilla folks? 
Yes. But other than yeah, other than that, it was horizontal and like whoever wanted to kind of seize the power could do that. And I don't, you know, mm-hmm. and it was I think quite unique in that in that respect. So yeah. As a yeah, so little... we went through and just looked at um, you know, that those exhibitions and you know, sort of kept records of of um the artists who were in those exhibitions and that's really you know that informs um the selection for the exhibition i think i interrupted someone now oh charles yes. uh, i was going to say as an example of the horizontal horizontality of godzilla uh it seemed like we would just kind of almost organically break out into subcommittees so to speak and and handle different tasks and it was very informed, just like, oh, what do you feel? You know, oh, yeah, I'll be involved in trying to organize a show or things like that. Um, right. There was a committee for everything. Each exhibition was organized by a committee. I mean, someone did take charge of it, but, you know, anyone could join. Yeah, and, but it wasn't like you weren't voted into that committee. No, or no. That. It was just designated if you're yourself. you're interested in doing it, do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Should I speak about the newsletter a little bit? Yes, because I want to talk about the newsletter because um, I mentioned early on that one of the goals of Godzilla of that very first meeting was to have a publication, a journal or a newsletter. And lo and behold, in 1991, after membership uh, grew a little bit, the first newsletter um, was published and Charles I, I thought he had designed the logo, but he told me he was actually responsible for that first newsletter. It was a momentous occasion. A copy of it is can be found in Howie Chen's anthology. Um, and, and you have to remember that this is a time before digital publishing. And so, um, so Charles, tell us about the, uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> about the newsletter. I, I mentioned it in, in regards to the horizontality of labor <laughs> uh, because um, I, uh, well, at the time I was, my day job was graphic design and I was trying to teach myself graphic design and the com- desktop computers were just coming in or just starting to emerge. And uh, the place that I worked had a little Apple Macintosh, you know, one of those early ones. And so I was trying to teach myself that. And um, within the ranks of Godzilla, um, I always felt in the, especially in the earlier days, quite naive in terms of the political discussions that were going on. Uh, being from Hawaii, it, it, you know, people on the, main, Asians on the mainland were just a lot more politically active than we were in Hawaii. Um, but I thought, oh, doing the newsletter is a way I can contribute to Godzilla. Uh, and it's, it was kind of win-win. I could work on learning graphic design on the computer and so on, which really made the newsletter possible. Um, well, yeah. one of the things you did was design a very distinctive logo, which is, I, I always think of around an eye, which yes. of course, <laughs> <laughs> uh, in, in East Asian culture, eyes are a source of um, insult and, um, so I always wanted to ask you about that and how conscious you were about your decision to focus on the Asian eye as the local for Godzilla. Yeah, I, um, I was fairly conscious of it. I, I did not know about the insult component, but, um, Oh, no, you never yeah. get, you never, <laughs> oh, maybe because you're from Hawaii, but <laughs> right, right. <laughs> never insulted. But, but I was, um. So I, Those you know, blurs about well, another eyes. amazing thing about this Godzilla experience coming from a publishing point of view was there were no reviews or anything. <laughs> I just sort of did what I wanted and people seemed to agree. And so, oh, I know uh, it's great. That's a unique experience. <laughs> no committees or anything. Um, uh, and so in designing the logo, I really wanted to put forward Godzilla as this forward thinking organization. And um, I don't know, I just kind of landed on sci-fi. So I was kind of going for a science fiction kind of 
vibe to it, you know, by using these curves and the, uh, it was a little bit of a riff on 60s sci-fi with the ellipse shape and then the eye of Godzilla. And although I didn't see it as an insult, I did view it as a challenge. Oh no, I'm not saying that I'm, I'm, I'm saying I saw your t using the eye as a reclamation. Oh that. yes, yes, it was yeah. definitely, it was, you know, it was a chat, it was like, you can't avoid it. <laughs> Just, mm -hmm. And it made a nice focal point and it's yeah. It's graphically striking and yeah. yeah. And then the font I used was, you know, coming right out of the eighties, it was such an eighties sort of, it's called modula and yeah. And, and these modula is a direct uh, child of computers uh, being involved in uh, type design those you know, some of the early experiments with it. And so it was really, I, I really wanted it to be al current, if you will. And, uh, you know. It looked pretty sharp. <laughs> and it, <you laughs> and know, not looking in the past too. Not that it wasn't, we weren't a, an good. organization, you know, trying to dig up our past so much as moving forward. Uh, yeah. So it, and I, it has um, everyone, could, I mean, anyone who wanted to contribute contributed it had reviews and yes exhibitions. and it was it was a crazy process because we had no editorial staff or anything like yeah. that so people wrote articles and they had to deliver them to me on little floppy disks because that's mm. used then and it was a I describe it as herding cats <laughs> you know yeah. people, it's like okay deadline's coming up <laughs> and, you know anyway it was it was Pretty chaotic. Uh, it was so it was chaotic. Always an adventure uh, pulling it together, and then going down and meeting with Corky Lee, who was oh. the printing rep for the printing company we we're we were using. So oh, I, Corky yes, and I, I would hang out and <laughs> that <laughs> in the meat packing district, and it was yeah, it was a yeah. So that was a real uh, that was a real community effort and then there were the mailing parties yes. where everything had to be yeah and mailing and parties and stamped because you know um and put in the mail so it was quite an, an undertaking and it was actually those mailing parties were a lot of fun i have to say because there i mean one of the things i'm I, that's come through in in the conversations is just the network part of it was also you mm -hmm. know it was fr friendships there were just a lot of friendships formed and and that continued today um but uh, on the first um, issue of the newsletter, there was an article about Mel Chin. Um, uh, yes. One of the things that Godzilla did was invite um, kind of celebrity Asian American artists <laughs> to come talk to us. Um, and Mel was one of them. And uh, Martin Wong, we went to see Martin Wong. Cowboy Show at PPOW and David Medella. And, you know, that was that was just one, that was the big event uh, that was um, really special. And so Mel's talk was written up in, I think, the second issue. But the first issue, Byron Kim wrote an article about Mel and it was about his piece Revival Field and which received support from the NEA, I believe, and um, which was rescinded. But Mel, I wonder if you could just talk about that moment because as there are so many parallels between the 90s and our current times in terms of social and political, well, culture wars, you know, and the kind of division of different um, political um, positions in, in the world and uh, in the New York art world, in the world at large and everything. So could you just revisit that moment and give us a sense of what the 90s were like from the point of view of an artist who's embroiled in political controversy. Well, um, I want to say that uh, that first meeting was so important with Godzilla because what I recall was the criticality involved, even after my presentation, the questioning of uh, right uh, of the work, where's the maybe the Asian face of it, and the whole discussion of that. Of course, uh, being Chinese, uh, of course, it's there anyway, but. Uh, uh, the the notion that I was being confronted is to try to put formal ideas uh, uh, embedded in a work with political context to 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 say things you can't say uh, using the devices of art rather than the agitprop of the time. 
of course, uh, very important, even after doing these works and showing at the Hirshhorn, my first museum show, uh, with things like Side of the True Cross, Opera of Silence, and different pieces, uh, extraction, plenty. Oh, yes. I wonder uh, if we have that slide from that period. Um, yeah. Maybe that could be found. Yeah. yeah. Like, this is Opera of Silence. And what is the commentary on China, Tibet, and the CIA, the, the, uh, the, the hawk-eyed face of it? Uh, is the crest of the CIA, and then it kind of was And conveying. is this the work from 19, the late 1988, it's in the collection of the Walker Art Center at the time. And I was trying to uh, use this methodology to say things other than what was current at the time in the 90s, which was totally great. You know, you have Barbara Kruger, you have all these different people making these statements. But I said, the alternative is how to make something to hold within the mind or the uh, I, uh, a message to make it worthy of uh, contemplation. Um, of course, what was important after making all this work and deciding that's what I love doing most, I quit it all and, <laughs> and stopped. And eventually what came up was Revival Field. And Revival Field was a, was a breakthrough piece for me because I, I, uh, I really truly embarked on this mutative strategy to to go against myself, essentially, and uh, to pursue the conceptual art to where it could lead. And uh, the important part of it and how Godzilla fits into this picture at the time, it is that critical, the critical discussions we were having at the time, as well as uh, most importantly, the camaraderie. Mm -hmm. Because when the revival field was rejected in uh, by the first, chair of the NEA had rejected it. Uh, uh, it was the first rejection by chair of the NEA, which means you had no way of, of contesting it. It had passed the presidential council, even the pieces that uh, from Karen Finley to Miller and all the, the NEA notorious and infamously great artists that were being stopped by the NEA because of its sexual or homosexual content uh, or performance content. Uh, I was chosen because I mentioned things like invisible aesthetics and social agenda to just be iced out. The rules of the NEA at the time was if the chair rejected it, it's over. There's no discourse. And it was because of this uh, relationships uh, that I understood amongst the art community, especially Godzilla, uh, that we were able to gather voice of protests. So I was able to have that audience with the NEA. I mean, it took everything from the American Museum, Art Directors Association, Walter Hopps to Martin Friedman at the time, and and uh, but uh, the uh, American Artist Network, a bunch of spies involved with that at the NEA. We were able to have an audience and reverse the rejection. Uh, uh, I think it was an attempt to. Uh, this rejection was an attempt to show the power of someone in authority to, to stop it, to say it's over. And I felt that was what had to be fought. It's not the, exactly the meaning of a revival field or even, but the voice of an artist to be stopped was not to be, we had to fight. And I think the confidence that Godzilla uh, collected uh, was part of that because I could rely on the comrades that mm -hmm. were behind me. I remember hearing from being you, many people during that period that, that allowed me to uh, uh, put up the show we had to do to invert his veto. And I think that was what, um, I just want to thank everybody that was part of that at that time. It was not a solo adventure. It was an attempt to, uh, to present the voice of an artist in the face of authority. And um, so, uh, you get strong if you work with Godzilla. You get beastly, <laughs> you know. So it was groovy. It was it was groovy. The, the climate then as now, even now more so. I I really appreciate what Bing says. We have to roar and roar again because look what's happening. Uh, and I am totally. I'm working on a piece now about uh, a Palestinian infant that was killed by the 2000 bomb bomb that they're dropping in the Gaza Strip. And I really um, have, again, this, this, uh, 
this confidence or this this drive that stays with me because of our formative years. You should never lose it. Thank you, Bing. Bing, you're, I'm thanking Bing through you, Mel. Thank you, Mel. Bing. Well, thank you, Bing. Because Bing and I'm <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just so um, kind of heartened by the exhibition, by the publication, these recent publications, which add to the literature of Asian American art. And of course, um, I hope this all leads to, you know, further exploration of Godzilla in a museum show sometime, um, that would be wonderful. So I thank you all for joining us. It was so, um, it was good to revisit Godzilla from the perspective of today. The exhibition is up for a couple more weeks, I think. Through, through March 16th. Okay, so it, uh, yes. best to be seen as, in person as always. Uh, and I think there's Q and A. It's yes. Yeah, I'm gonna jump in. First of all, I just want to say thank you so so much for this conversation, which has been a pleasure to listen to. Um, thank you all of you for for your input and for for talking us through this show. Um, we do have a few audience questions and if anyone in the audience has a question, um, but you haven't asked it yet, feel free to post it in the chat and I'll pass you the virtual mic to ask. Um, the first question is going to be from GE. GE, I'll give you the chance to unmute. Thank you so much, Chloe. And thank you so, so much, everyone, for this discussion. Uh, it's kind of a, a different kind of a... Can, can we say that as Godzilla can draw on his near imaginable power to accomplish almost anything normally beyond his own amazing standards, that the group kind of took this as a direct or indirect prompt? I thought the prompt was there. I mean, we we were existing in a condition uh, of which, you know, the, of course, the NEA actions and with Mel and all that were a focal point. But uh, you know, it wasn't a real friendly environment for Asian people at the time. Yeah, we we, we actually didn't talk about um, the first collective action of Godzilla. Um, which was, you know, a protest letter. Right. To the letter the writing Museum. to the Whitney. Yes. I was on the letter writing committee. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Can I, can I ask you, Jeannie, can I turn the table to you to which, oh, yeah. can you just so, tell everyone of, about that? Because yeah, I think one it's of the, so important. Yeah. One of the first actions, it's actually how I got my job at the Whitney. Um, one of the, our first actions was to write a letter to David Ross, who was the new director of the Whitney, about the lack of Asian American inclusion in the 1991 biennial, knowing that he was the new director and had nothing to do with it, but he was the head of the museum. And, and it was really because the, the Whitney had made such great claims about diversity and how diverse you know, the, the um, 91 biennial was. I think Martin Wong was in the group material part of it and, and John Hanhart always included, was quite inclusive in his video program. So I have very vivid memories sitting in the stairwell of the old Whitney at 75th and Madison and addressing this letter to, which had been drafted by a group, um, to the trustees of the Whitney. And we met with David Ross and the 1993 biennial was a very different biennial and hopefully reflected some of our discussions. Thank you so much for that question, GE, and thank you all for your answers. Um, I have an anonymous question that came in. Um, thank you so much to all of you for this conversation. I can't help but notice that there are a few people missing from the exhibition, notably some of the Godzilla members who spearheaded the protests and withdrawal from the canceled Mocha show, and I was curious if anyone could speak to that decision. Um, yeah, I... Um... Definitely, there's, you know, the, art, the um, show is quite inclusive in the sense that there's 39 artists in the exhibition. Um, there's not every artist who was part of um, Godzilla or who exhibited with Godzilla. Um, 
just for sort of like obvious reasons that it's a you know curated exhibition we do have two spaces but you know there are decisions that were made um there's definitely there was definitely no curatorial decision that um was connected to artists who withdrew from the 2021 exhibition but did not figure into anything thanks jennifer um the last question today, well, I'll ask a question before we before we turn to Fong for the last question. I was curious um, to hear Emily and Charles and Mel about your work being in conversation with um, with some artists that Eric Firestone sort of brought into this dialogue about Godzilla, and if there were any new connections you made through the exhibition or um, new connections to to other artists or to other works through the show. One of the things that struck me about the show, which is not really a direct answer to your question, was um, the strategies or in thinking about a show that is inherently anchored in a kind of identity politics, uh, it doesn't look like that kind of a show to me. I, I love the nuances, the, the slyness of approaches and so on in addressing identity politics and yet not hitting you over the head with it. And, and I find that uh, the relationships in regards, because, you know, all the work is way about way more than identity politics. But when I take those aspects of it and put them together, it's, you know, really quite sophisticated and uh, interesting uh, in its strategies. Um, yeah. I appreciate that. And um, you had mentioned that to me when we saw each other. Charles um and I actually it's my favorite like you know critique or comment about the exhibition um because I think there are obviously so many different stories and issues of identity are addressed in the work but um I think that in general I'm always more interested in art that you know doesn't is not dogmatic in terms of hitting you over the head with what it's about and like just the way that you were talking about your painting jug boy and um how mysterious it is and how it can't be completely unraveled um and i really think that that's true of so much work in the show and it's just really inspiring to me and it deals with identity um issues and trauma i mean we didn't bring up you know the word trauma but there are so many different um you know, cultural traumas that are addressed in the work. Um, but I think that in general, the work is so transformative and so transcendent. Um, and, and that's just really beautiful. So I'm thanking all of you for, for that. Well, it certainly was, um reaffirming and re-educational for me because um man it's, it's, by the way i've never been in a whitney biennial uh, my process were separate uh, regarding uh but that's a whole nother story but i'm okay with that i'm in this show so it's it was mm -hmm. uh terrific to be part of something and, and looking at uh the artists that i've known and met and did looking at the work and seeing all the things i've missed and that reaffirming aspect is so important to be amongst your peers that you spent some time with and to to love what they're doing and being part of that whole cycle so thank you for being there for me you know really it's been great i was just gonna say that uh yeah i i really enjoy the different ways of getting into the work the different works you know the first thing, the first layer is really the time period and the decade and the stylistic concerns that were part of that decade. Um, you see a lot of use of thicker paint and a, a sort of a more crude handling of a, of a paint, which was maybe a Godzilla force emanating out into the art world. Um, and then you could read it semiotically in terms of the, the the different symbolism and also the different symbolism from different countries. You know, 
um, when I looked at Helen Oji's painting, um, the volcano, which looked like Mount Fuji to me, but I don't, I'm not really sure that Mount Fuji is a volcano. Uh, so, you, you know, and, and, and that some of the other works are, um, have little pieces of their, um, I guess their ethnic origins. And, and then there was the, you know, the, um, the, the sort of spiritual or the more transcendent way of looking at the work. So, you know, you could really, and then you could see different pieces talking to each other mm -hmm. in different rooms and across the two galleries. So that was uh, uh, a very rich way to spend the time kind of piecing things together. And then of course, talking to people about what they were interested in and what they were thinking about, which I really appreciated both Mel and 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 Charles kind of saying what they were thinking about because they didn't realize that I had a connection with those specific uh, things that we we're all working on together, but maybe they look different now. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank, Thank you. you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you for those beautiful answers. Um, I loved listening to that. Our, our last question today is going to be from Fong. Fong, I'll give you the chance to ask your question. <laughs> Thank you, Chloe. Thank you, Eugenie. Hi, Mel. Hi. Thank you, Jennifer, Emily, and Charles. And uh, yeah, I don't remember whether when Susan Solon, you know, Susan Rowland told me when exactly or 21 started. You remember, Eugenie? I think it might have found it right after September 11. Oh, 2001, maybe? Two yeah. Years. I think mm -hmm. so, but because I know on season one, feature different you know ideas with the uh, place, location, identity, and but I remember spirituality that segment. That's where Mel and Hamilton and who else? James Terrell was feature. Mm. Maybe That's on consumption. <laughs> yeah. No, maybe Mel is on consumption with mm. Pepe Osorio and yeah. The, Anyway, I, I, it brought me so much on the subject of being half in Asia still and half here. So when I, when we did the interview with Mel um, in 2018, when, when he had the great show at Queen's Museum in the rail, um, in the typical conventional portrait, I asked Mel to send, Mel to send in a portrait. He said, no, Fong. I'm half in China, I'm half here. So can you make a portrait of me with a buffalo represent America <laughs> and the rabbit <laughs> represent me? So here it is. Kissing. Yeah, so it's, a, it's an interesting concept, which leads me to, uh, to ask the question, you know, I was traumatized myself come to America in 1980 and then went to school in Philadelphia, one year in high school and then four years in art school. Um, of course, you want to assimilate to the culture. And at some point, I realized there's a huge difference looking at Cheese's figure when I first traveled to Italy on a traveling fellowship in 86. So much of the body of Christ being portrayed prominently, dramatically, whether from Duccio to Giotto, all the way down to Manner's paintings, you know, on sculpture, for sure. Still today, um, it's dramatic figure. He's hanging on the cross. He's half naked, incredibly sexy, erotically, uh, very <laughs> um, <laughs> capable of arousing any kind of uh, stimulant. Uh, but Compared to Buddha, he sits under the Bodhi tree. He's trying to reach Nirvana. There's no action. There's nothing going on. Mm -hmm. So that brings to the question is how how do we mediate the uniqueness of you, you know, individuality? Because this is the pressure to conform, to be accepted, to grow with everything else in this culture. And then the participatory of a of the community, which is exactly the beginning of Godzilla to begin with. Um, so my question is uh, probably 
to you all, uh, how do we make that balance even today? Let's start with uh, Mel. <laughs> Well, you have to review. Uh, well, thank you, Fong. Uh, Fong. Look, uh, you have to be a double agent. You mm. have to <laughs> exercise all your mind, uh, the capacity to exercise your individuality. And, and the most important thing out of all this conversation is the concept of voice. Mm -hmm. You have to voice, regardless of what people may say, to gather the strength to be part of a larger community, maybe covertly or secretly because your strength will be amplified and their strength will be amplified uh, by this these actions. And in, in the world of uh, the uh, politics we have today, which is almost every aspect from uh, capitalism on to Jesus on the cross, you know, uh, we have to be the resistance. And sometimes you can't do it individually, but the strength of collective action is key and paramount. And to to his voice and also listening, I feel, to mm -hmm. look at the opposite conversation, to practice criticality, no matter where you are, especially of oneself. So I think it's uh, not trying to get away from it, but even more important than ever to to break break through to what we have. It's not finding my way, mm -hmm. but finding our way, collective way. And uh and so it's constantly an act of resistance, even among, against yourself. Because just when you get to that point of delusion to think you're something, you better forget about it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So thank you. Thank you for asking. Well, that's the power of Tao. Um, yes, indeed. So you sound like a master, Mel. All right. Let's... <laughs> I'm far from that. You know that. There's too much evidence to the contrary. <laughs> uh, Charles? What, what... <laughs> yeah, I actually want to add a little bit uh, to what Mel said, you know, which was fantastic. Uh, but on a, on a personal note, um, I found, and this is really more looking in retrospect, um, uh, but... Um, my involvement with Godzilla was hugely important in developing a self-confidence. Uh, mm. You know, as growing up a minority person, self-confidence isn't a real big <laughs> attribute mm. a lot of us have. You know, and 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 it was it was just being involved with all these smart, dynamic people and um, really creating a different kind of modeling system in my own uh, self. And um, so I, I think it was really instrumental in, in developing a, a self-confidence, which, you know, of course, is fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Emily, what do you think? You know, I, I love the idea of being a double agent. And I think that as artists, we are all double agents to a certain extent because we say one thing through our art but it doesn't, it's, it's a nonverbal language. But yeah. now I'm actually thinking after Charles was talking that I, I think I'm a triple agent because, <laughs> you know, because I, I, I'm a, um, I'm a woman and I'm an Asian American oh, and, yeah. and then I'm an artist. And uh, there is so much division today that yeah. you don't know which side it's going to come out of. And mm -hmm. so there's always a level of uh, tamping down the real, uh, your real subjects and your real uh, information and what you know and what you believe in and, you know, et cetera. Um, because, but I, I really uh, try to embrace things that don't have division. And I, mm -hmm. uh, the, the dialogue is more important to me than to feel right or to be right. So mm -hmm. um, so I think this is a really important time for artists because we can open the dialogue. And, and that's what we were put in the art world to do. It's not about me. It's about the dialogue. So eloquently put it the way you just did. Thank you. Thank you so much, there, Emily. Uh, Eugenie, any last word from wisdom from you, my old friend? I have no words of wisdom. 
I I will just say Godzilla really was um, a, a transformational. Joining Godzilla was transformational for me. Um, I was a grad. I grew up in the Midwest where there was really no. Um, Asian population. I was the child of immigrants. And I was going to graduate school at Columbia. Um, and I felt so alien to the experience. Um, I studied the Western canon of art history, and I think I got a really good education. Mm -hmm. But being at the very same time in Godzilla just opened my eyes. It opened doors. It made me realize that what I was learning was great and fantastic and only one part of a much larger story. Mm. And so um, I've always felt that I, you know, the double agent and maybe even triple agent is so apt because you realize you occupy these different communities and inter and they intersect and, and you're part of all of them. And somehow you bring them together and, um, but, but it's not always easy. And so, um, yeah, it's certainly been one of the most meaningful experiences of my life. Wow. Yeah, I, your dissertation was on Robert Smithson. My dissertation was on Robert Smithson. And now I have all these ideas about I Robert read Smithson it. and the spiral jetty. Well, oh. And, you know, and because I've been looking at Ken, Ken Tam's work and the presence and, and Oscar Yeho and the presence of East Asian labor in that area, working on the Transcontinental mm -hmm. Railroad, which is not very far from the Spiral Jetty. And I was like, oh, I never thought that there were the presence of East Asians in that area. So, you know, there are all kinds of interesting intersections that begin to happen. And um, yeah. That's brilliant. Uh, okay, maybe one more question, if you allow me, Chloe, um, is to Jennifer. Um, you already spoke of the the urgent the urgency to create um, to put this show together. Uh, how how is the public perception and response been so far? Yes, I wanted to say thank you, Fawn, for having all of us. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm glad to be here. Um, so there's been a really incredible public response to the exhibition. Um, you know, the gallery has been um, crowded and there's been a, um, a lot of people who have, you know, come in to see the exhibition um, and uh, it's it's drawn um, a bigger Asian American audience than we've had in the gallery. So it's also exciting to be engaging that community more, more deeply than we have before. Um, but I think in general, I would characterize the response as being, um, you know, really excited um, to see the show. Um, I also, you know, learned through um, putting the show on that so many people, um, you know, have done their own research and really looked into um, the history of Godzilla. And that's just, that was just really, exciting to learn. There's been a number of, um, you know, artists who are professors who've told me, oh, my students have given presentations, uh, you know, from their own research, from their own initiative, not based on, you know, um, presentations that they were giving to their students. Um, and they were, you know, coming across the history of Godzilla and presenting to, you know, their cohort about it. And, um, and so I would say that, uh, I would just characterize the audience as like really hungry to see this kind of an exhibition and to see um, really specifically an exhibition of 39 Asian American artists. Um, so, you uh -huh. know, it's, it, it's, it's exciting. It's wonderful. It's, um, I'm really, I'm really happy that that happened. That's great. That's terrific. Mm -hmm. Well, I just say that horizontality, uh, the equal treatment in every single space in Asia, Chinese painting particularly, um, have significant influence on Van Gogh and maybe even Bruegel for that matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the verticality of the West 
versus the horizontality of the East, it's still a very much a live conversation. It's perpetuate. It's interesting. So thank you so much. Eugenie, thank you. For Thanks for inviting me, Fong. It's well, you're going to come back, I think. We need you to do more moderation. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Mel. Thank, thank you, you for Paul. having us. Thank you, Jennifer. Good. Coming yeah. back to Captain Staggerman. Yes. Thank, thank you, you for to having Brooklyn us. Rail. That was such a great question, Bong, and thank you all so much for those incredibly generous uh, and illustrative answers. Um, we are going to conclude with a reading. Mel Chin chose um, a poem, and I'm going to read Mel's intro, and then at Mel's request, I will read poems. Um, suggested for today is the suggested poems that I'll read for today are from Women Writers of Traditional China from Stanford University Press in 1999, Kai Yan's 18 Songs of a Nomad Flute from era one eight from year 176 or early third century in thinking of the art world and art history as our heaven or haven and godzilla and other artists laments about representation and voice back in the 80s these poems came to mind and i'll read song eight and nine heaven is supposed to have eyes how can it not see me drifting alone spirits should have some power how came I south of the sky and north of the sea? I did not offend heaven. How could heaven match me with such a strange mate? I did not offend the spirits. How could the spirits have cast me into the distant wilderness? I composed my eighth song to give form to my grief. How could I know when the peace was done, my sorrow would be more intense? And song nine, Heaven has no horizon, earth no borders. My heart's grief is likewise boundless and unceasing. Human life passes swiftly, like a white horse flashing by a crack. Here I am in the prime of life with never a happy day. I am angry and wish to question heaven, but heaven is so vast. I have no way to reach it. I raise my head and gaze up into its empty clouds and smoke. Thanks. Um, I would just like to say thank you uh, so, 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 so much to Jennifer, to Emily, to Charles, to Eugenie, to Mel for this conversation today, which has been such a joy. I would also like to thank Bing for the contribution of the talisman at the beginning. Um, and I'm glad that Bing was able to be here in that way. Um, I would also, of course, like to thank the team at Eric Firestone, Alabelle, um, and the team at company agenda who were so supportive in preparing for today's event and provided much of the imagery that you were able to look at the show. We'd also like to thank the Terra Foundation for American Art who sponsor the new social environment program and make daily conversations like this one possible. They also support our archive where you'll be able to view this video shortly. Um, the rail has been free and independent for 23 years. A donation directly supports our writers, our production staff, and our operations. You can support our work through the link in the chat. And if you're free tomorrow at 1 p.m., I encourage you to join us for a conversation between Jennifer T. and Barbara Pollock on the occasion of Jennifer's exhibition at Ancestral Beginnings, Sessile Beings at Tina, Tina Kim Gallery. And as is rail tradition, you can now turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you so, so much for joining us today and wishing you all a lovely rest of your Tuesday. And thank you, Chloe. <laughs> thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank thank you. you everyone. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, Mel. Great to see okay, you I'll here. see you up there sometime. Thank you, thank you Jennifer. Thank you so much. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Let's make a lot of noise. Congratulations yeah. on the show. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Go see the show, you guys, please. Oh, it's so brilliant. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you so much for being here today, everyone. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Have a great you. afternoon. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.